Good afternoon. Uh, my name is uh, Lieutenant General Guy Thibault, retired uh, president of the Conference of Defense Associations. Uh, conference was established in 1932, and the uh, Conference of Defense Association is an umbrella organization for over 40 member groups who represent over 400,000 active and retired members of the Canadian Armed Forces. Uh, we're a connector in the defense and security community uh, in Canada that provides uh, influence and visibility for member associations and national engagement, as well as a hub for where Canadians interested in matters of security and defense can converge uh, for events. And on behalf of our members and our sister organization, the CDA Institute, I'd really like to take this opportunity to welcome Member of Parliament, uh, Randall Garrison, the representative of the New Democratic Party of Canada. Randall is an elected member for Esquimalt uh, Saanich Sook in British Columbia, my home province. Uh, he's a strong advocate for the environment, gay and transgender issues, and has had previously uh, worked uh, researching policing in Afghanistan, a topic that we've all been following with great interest in the last couple of, uh, couple of weeks. And he's been the NDP's defense critic on the National Defense Committee uh, in the Commons, and so he knows many of the issues that I think we're interested in talking today on his personal side, as well as where the New Democratic Party stand on, on issues relating to defense and security. So, Mr. Garrison, thank you very much for, for making time with us. I have a, a number of questions that I'd like to kind of just uh, run through with you to, to explore. We're asking all of these same uh, questions of three main parties. And uh, this is, I think, really an important way to help inform and educate Canadians on issues of national security and defense as they head to the polls uh, in, the, in the coming days. So with that, uh, maybe we can start uh, right off the top, uh, just uh, looking uh, at broadly based uh, the issues of defense policy. And uh, as you know, uh, under the current government, uh, they had an extensive consultation on, uh, with Canadians and stakeholders on Canada's uh, defense policy, strong, secure, engaged. And from the NDP's perspective, uh, perhaps you might you know, offer some thoughts on what changes you think uh, are necessary with respect to Canada's defense policy and why. Well, can I just start by saying that for me personally, uh, defense issues are very important because I did international human rights work abroad, both in East Timor and Afghanistan, and I was there when Canadian peacekeeping groups were present. Uh, it's also important to me as a constituency representative in that I represent probably the second largest military riding uh, in the country, in the home of the Canadian Navy. So when uh, Strong, Sir, and Engage came out, I was obviously very interested in uh, what the Liberals were suggesting. And, and I guess what I'd say is that its biggest promise was one I thought was important, and that was to focus on people serving in the military and to make sure they have the skills, the equipment, the training that they need. But I would also say that that's turned out to be the biggest failure of this Liberal government. So uh, we'll get some chance to talk about some of those things later. But I, I think if you're asking me specifically uh, where the emphasis ought to go now, uh, now that we're five years, almost going to be five years down the road from strong, secure and engaged, I would say there's uh, a few things I'd like to see. Going back to respect for serving members, uh, I think that the, the next government needs to deliver action and not words on sexual misconduct. And I know we may get to, to come back to that later. Uh, they need to deliver better mental health services, both to serving members and to veterans. And they need to revise or scrap the University of, Sal uh, University of Service rule. Uh, so we stop disposing of members who have lots of skills and lots to offer just because they've been injured and may not be able to do 100% of the things that someone might need to do in the Canadian military. Um, second area is on sovereignty and autonomy. Uh, and I think the pandemic has really raised these concerns to a very high level for me. And that is we need to avoid over-reliance on foreign suppliers of critical capabilities and critical materials. And the pandemic showed how quickly those international uh, supply lines can break down. But it, it's also uh, the experience with the last U.S. president also showed us that sometimes you can't count on even our most uh, longstanding and friendly allies to be there when the crunch comes. So I think we have to be a little less reliant there. And in, in Canada, I'd also like to see a stop further privatization of the support services for the Canadian military. I think it raises security concerns about having contractors on the base who may not have secure employment, who may not have the kind of security checks they need to have. But it raises a much bigger concern for me and that is the loss of the capabilities and institutional knowledge that we need, especially in maintenance, uh, to keep the Canadian forces running in an emergency situation. And the final area would be on an international role. 
I think there are two things that uh, a new democratic government would do. And one of those is we'd recommit in a major way to the multilateral agencies that we belong to and reserve, resume a, a leadership role, I guess is what I would say in those. So there's a lot of things that we ha are still members of like NATO, where we make some commitments, but we don't really in the NATO forum provide a leadership role on things like disarmament. Uh, and I think there's a big role for us there. It's a traditional role we've played. And the other area, of course, I think we need a major and real recommitment to international peacekeeping. Canada's got a long history and some, some unique capabilities for serving in international peacekeeping role. One of those is the bilingual, bicultural, uh, and, and now even multicultural role of the Canadian military, which allows us perhaps a better understanding of conflicts that are based on language and ethnicity. Uh, and I think the second one is the fact that we're not a major power. And so that sometimes we can go in and play a much better role because of the fact that we're not one of the main players on the stage. So those are the three areas that uh, I think we need to do some revision of, of that defense policy. Okay, great. Well, uh, you know, I think some very, you know, useful perspectives. Certainly when we think a little bit about, uh, as you said, the, the pandemic really reinforcing the importance of the supply chain, the whole sustainment of the force, uh, focusing on the members. You know, I think those are really all quite important and uh, recommitment with our allies uh, and our presence in the international uh, context. And so appreciate you sharing those views. And maybe this is going to perhaps uh, risk going uh, and repeating some of that, but if elected and uh, or, you know, in a, in a position to have a significant influence on, the, on a future government from the New Democratic Party's perspective, what would you see as being, say, that the top three issues of all of what you just described that, uh, that you would want to see focused on? Well, we've got a real confidence crisis in, uh, in leadership in the Canadian military right now, and that revolves around the ability of all Canadians to serve equally in the Canadian forces. And that, to me, is the, is the nub of the issue of sexual misconduct. It means that some people can't serve without fear of being subjected to conduct which would uh, shorten their careers or make it impossible to continue to serve. So that's my highest priority, is restoring that confidence that everybody can serve equally in the Canadian military. Uh, second, of course, is something I've always said as NDP critic, and that is ensuring that those who are serving have the equipment, training, and support they need to do this difficult and dangerous work we ask them to do all the time on our behalf. And that carries through to when they become veterans. We can't just uh, forget about the service people have done and deny them the supports they need as veterans. And finally, a third personal priority of mine, uh, which I think should be a higher priority of everybody talking about defense, is mental health. In the, in the Canadian military. Um, and we know that um, a lot more could have been done in the last parliament. Uh, we had held hearings on mental health in the defense committee, which got derailed by the liberal filibuster. Um, and, and we learned some important things there. We learned that services really aren't available when they're needed. Uh, quite often, they're not available outside of business hours. And of course, there are often long wait lists. And someone who's having a mental health crisis can't be told to come back in 18 months, right? This is not an acceptable answer. And so we have to get busy uh, solving that. There's also an attitudinal change that needs to happen. And uh, I've been uh, putting forward a private member's bill to take self-harm out of the code of conduct as a disciplinary offense. Uh, Malingering would still be there. That's a different question. But what it would indicate is that the Canadian forces recognize that all injuries aren't visible but that those non-visible injuries are injuries just the same and that we should respond with supports rather than discipline uh, to those kinds of injuries. So those are my, those are my top three things I'd like to work on in, in, in the next parliament, no matter who's government. I appreciate uh, your focus on, on the men and, men and women who are serving. And, uh, you know, I think ultimately they're the, uh, they're the credentials of the Canadian forces at home and abroad. And I think, uh, you know, you're, it's a, it's a wonderful way to kind of reinforce the fact that the, the Canadian forces, uh, you know, focus on the men and women really should be a top priority for, for, all, for all of us. Um, maybe I can turn a, turn a little bit to, uh, towards uh, some of the, uh, the, the issues of funding for, for national defense. And I uh, was watching uh, um, uh, your, your leader uh, on the CBC yesterday, and they were talking about the NDP's kind of plans for for investment and uh, and uh, and spending, and um, defense spending is, is always been controversial in this country. Uh, you know, we uh, 
uh, have NATO targets of 2% of GDP, which uh, no government has uh, really ever, except in wartime, sort of met uh, in terms of uh, that, uh, that kind of ambition. Um, national defense as a part of the overall government's discretionary fund, uh, funding is, uh, is a very large part. And so when governments look to sort of make ends meet and deal with budgetary uh, deficits, uh, inevitably defense comes into to the window. And so I'm just wondering if you might be able to share some of your thoughts with respect to uh, how national defense uh, with, uh, with the NDP's sort of uh, kind of view on, on leadership or again in terms of holding a government to, uh, to account would see the issues of defense spending, especially when, uh, when we know that there's a number of important capability gaps, whether it be in continental defense working with the modernization of, uh, of our continental defense relationships with the, with the United States for NORAD or uh, emerging areas of space and the threats that we see uh, in the cyber domain. So what would you see as being kind of the views from the NDP with respect to defense spending? Well, we just voted for the budget this year. And uh, in the case of defense, we didn't get to, to debate it in committee again because there, were, there was a liberal filibuster going on over accountability. Uh, but the Democrats voted for the budget. And that budget contained what? You, know, it's, you have to be careful of apples and oranges in budgets, but essentially contained over the two years about a 5% annual increase to the operating budget for Canadian military. And that's what I've been calling for as our defense critic. Because inflation is a bit higher in uh, military and defense areas than it is in general, uh, we need increases that keep up to that. We can't keep asking the Canadian forces to do more and more every year with less and less in real dollar terms. So we supported that budget. And also the budget contains baked in plans for procurement, for the shipbuilding that's going on and for the future jet purchases. And we've also supported that. So sometimes it does get posed to me, well, why are we spending on the military instead of X? And of course, my answer to that, and Jugmeet's been very clear on this, that's a false choice. Why aren't we making sure that everybody in this country pays their fair share of taxes and generate the revenue we need to do both military spending and whatever other X it is that you care about deeply? It isn't a choice between the military and other things. Uh, we'd all like to live in a world where we didn't actually need a military. And I know that Canadian uh, serving members would like to live in that same world, right? But we don't live in that world. It's not realistic. And so uh, we, we shouldn't put forward those false choices between something we need for the security and sovereignty of our country and other things we might need just as much. That's great. Well, appreciate, uh, appreciate that perspective. And I would say that in the general kind of uh, consciousness, folks might not otherwise uh, sort of know really what the NDP's positions are on spending on defense. So appreciate you uh, sharing some of those, thought, those thoughts and a reminder that uh, you have been supporting uh, those defense budgets and the, uh, the commitments for, for the major capabilities. Maybe especially just given your, uh, your riding and the interests that you have in terms of Canada's maritime force, maybe we can actually talk a little bit about shipbuilding and the cost of the national shipbuilding strategy has certainly grown significantly from the original proposals. Uh, and uh, so with respect to uh, the investments being made for Canada's Navy, the Coast Guard, uh, and uh, certainly calls uh, for, for perhaps uh, looking to live within the means that we've got uh, and uh, making some difficult choices, what would be kind of some of your thoughts with respect to the overall uh, either the, the approach for Canada's national shipbuilding or the costs associated with it? Well, again, the Democrats have, since it was first put forward under the Conservatives, supported the national shipbuilding plan. Uh, it's unfortunate we had liberal and conservative governments that left re-equipping the Canadian forces go for a very long time. And so now we're in that unfortunate situation where we both need new ships, we need new planes. There's a lot of things we need because we didn't actually keep re-equipping on a rolling basis. So going forward, I think there's a lesson for us there that we can't just let these uh, needs pile up and then try to solve them all at once again. That would be a mistake. Uh, the second thing I've certainly learned being on the Defense Committee is that our military procurement system is broken, absolutely broken. And when, uh, when I talk to uh, members of Parliament Australia and the UK, and they're like, well, how does your system work? And I'm like, well, there's four ministers, six agencies uh, involved in every decision. And there, in both Australia and the UK, they say, oh no, we have one agency and one minister who can be held accountable for military procurement. And so in the long term, that's where we need to go in Canada. And that will not only, I think, give us better value for money, but it'll also give us better accountability for the money that is spent. If there's a minister, we can ask about this, 
if you go now and say, who's responsible for cost overruns in shipbuilding? Well, is it the minister in charge of procurement? Is it the minister in charge of treasury board? Is it the defense minister? Is it science and technology? I mean, all these people signed off on the contracts. So who's responsible? So I'd like to see a shift to a system where we've got somebody who's clearly accountable and one agency that's clearly um, accountable for keeping track of the costs. Well, it certainly seems that uh, this has been a historic challenge, certainly for Canada. And I know that, uh, you know, how you see the issues of defense procurement is, is a little bit of uh, where you sit in the overall kind of system. And uh, so it's been very interesting for me now that I've been, uh, now that I'm retired, to see the different perspectives. And certainly if you're in defense industry, uh, you're not very happy with it. If you're sitting in government, you're saying, well, we're moving the programs. Yes, the big, large uh, programs, uh, you know, inevitably are, are quite complex and uh, inherently political. And, you know, we need to get uh, good value in terms of good Canadian jobs and long-term sort of regional uh, employment. And uh, so there are many competing issues within the, the issues of defense uh, procurement. But certainly, uh, it's true that I think it's hard to find somebody to, to pin the blame on when things don't go particularly well. So, uh, good luck with that. I think that would be a great thing to accomplish if we could fix defense <laughs> procurement for sure. Um, maybe turning uh, turning our minds uh, just to, to a more recent um, um, sort of issue that confronted uh, Canadians and uh, did relate to our our uh, overseas operations and one in which, you know, your own background uh, studying the issues of policing in Afghanistan, I, I think would uh, perhaps be uh, be pertinent. Just uh, get any reflections that you have on uh, what we saw in terms of uh, Canada's engagement in, in the country and uh, how things kind of turned out with the rapid uh, turn of events with the Taliban uh, seizing control and Canadian uh, interpreters and uh, locally engaged staff that worked with uh, with us Afghans who supported Canada's mission, uh, many of them who got left behind. Uh, you know, it's not really, I don't want to make this a political kind of statement. I'm just kind of interested in your your kind of reflections on that whole issue from, from your perspective and from the, uh, from the NDP's perspective. Well, as somebody who worked in Afghanistan for a major international human rights organization, uh, I know that firsthand what we're actually talking about here. Uh, and during uh, one part of the mission I was on, we were uh, working in a, in a town and we came back to our hotel. There's a note in my mailbox uh, in English saying, if you're still here tomorrow, we're killing your driver and your translator. And so uh, we went down to the desk and we asked the hotel if we could pay in advance. No, no, we're not leaving. And we got up at 4 a.m. and we left because uh, those that were uh, concerned about the human rights work I was doing weren't going to kill me because that would be like scoring on your own goal, but they were gonna kill the driver and the translator. So the, the dangers we're talking about here for people who supported internationals and supported Canadians are very, very real. And because of that in July, I, I wrote a joint letter with our NDP immigration critic, uh, Jenny Kwan, uh, asking the government to put in gear immediately, that was in July, uh, the uh, evacuation programs. Don't wait, start now. And everything, I still have some contacts in Afghanistan. I have some contacts in the Canadian military. If you were paying attention, you knew that there was a distinct possibility that the Afghan government was going to fall to the Taliban very, very quickly. And so instead the government dithered for a month. And in, this, and, and in no way do I criticize the Canadian forces uh, and their efforts to rescue people. It was a decision by the government to wait until it was too late to get people out that caused this problem. Now, what's the solution overall? Well, I'm not our foreign affairs spokesperson, uh, and I'm not going to venture into something that long today, but I can, say, I can say one thing we've been very clear on. We will not recognize the Taliban government. This is a listed terrorist organization who took power by force, and they are not the legitimate government of Afghanistan. I oh, appreciate, uh, appreciate that and certainly appreciate your own kind of contributions to, uh, to humanitarian efforts in the country for sure. Um, if we could, I'd like to, to back out uh, completely. And it comes back, I think, to the world we, we live in and, uh, you know, where Canada's national defense and security kind of fits in that, uh, that context. We've, you know, we have threats to the, to the country that are manifest in, uh, in new emerging areas, whether it be cyber, whether it be misinformation or disinformation, actors that are looking to interfere with our system of uh, government. We have the international rules-based order being challenged by uh, countries like Russia, uh, in terms of the annexation of the Crimea, the, their uh, 
uh, activities in the, the, uh, the eastern part of the country in the Donbass region. We've got uh, China's own uh, kind of uh, actions, uh, both on the uh, diplomatic as well as on the military side in, in, the, in the region. And uh, it seems we're coming into a period of great power competition. And of course, uh, with, uh, with the United States and our allies, we're, we're kind of on one side of all of this, but I'm just, you know, we're, we're a modest sized country as, as I think you mentioned earlier, and uh, just wondering what kind of role you see for Canada and what kind of uh, issues we should be thinking about on the national security and defense side from, uh, from your party's perspective on what that great power competition means for a country like Canada. Well, you kind of asked me two things there, so let me deal briefly with the first one, and, and that is on some of the emerging threats with cybersecurity and disinformation. Once again here, I would emphasize that uh, our multilateral connections are where we need to emphasize. This, these aren't problems we can solve alone. And NATO has done some very good work, both on cybersecurity and disinformation with their centers of excellence on these topics. So I think a, a recommitment, again, to leadership and cooperation on those issues through NATO in particular uh, is the way we're going to meet those challenges. Now, on the question of Russia, once again, I've, I've got some personal experience in that uh, I was part of the Defense Committee. We went to Latvia and we visited our troops in, um, I've, I've just lost the date. I guess it was 2017 uh, on Operation Forward Presence. And uh, I'm very proud of the role we're playing there. And what we saw while the Defense Committee was there was the Russians massing troops a couple of hundred thousand troops on the border. Why? Because our defense committee was there. And this kind of saber rattling and pressure uh, is what we would see in spades if Canada weren't involved in, in NATO's uh, attempts to de defend democracy uh, and uh, defend sovereignty of its members in uh, Eastern Europe. And people sometimes forget that NATO has changed. Uh, it has a whole bunch more new members which are fledgling democracies uh, that need that space to develop and solidify uh, human rights and democratic uh, movements. And, and without us there participating in NATO, they, they wouldn't get that chance. Uh, I've also been to visit our mission in Ukraine uh, in the same year. Um, Operation Unifier is you know, part of a whole relationship we're building with Ukraine, which I think is quite important. Uh, we certainly have historic Ukrainian communities in this country that have lots of family ties. But also Ukraine uh, emerging as a democracy will be key to stability in Eastern Europe. And so I think, once again, we're playing a very important role there. And we know, I mean, I, once, I had someone say to me, why do we need a military? When's the last time a country seized another country by force. I'm like, well, I just came from the Ukraine. I can give you a pretty good example of how this works. So uh, in terms of great power things, again, uh, we're a middle power and we need to work through organizations like NATO. And that's the way through that cooperation and that solidarity that we can push back against Putin, uh, who, if, if we weren't there, as I said, would have already taken back the sphere of influence in Eastern Europe, just like he did in Belarus, uh, mostly because he can, I think, but also to serve the interests of access to markets and resources for the oligarchs in, in, in Russia. And, you know, we don't have a lot of time, but let me just say quickly on China, uh, that if we want to push back against China, there's some obvious things we can do, and that is to support Taiwan, support the democracy movement in Hong Kong, support free Tibet, and support the Uyghurs. Uh, and if we let any of these things slide, then that sends a very clear message to China that they can do more in terms of dominating the peoples around them or within their borders. And I think, you know, we've seen that the current government seems to have no policy for dealing with Chinese human rights abuses or uh, the abuse of their power in the region. And, and we've just passed the spectacle last week of the thousandth day in detention of Michael Kovrig and Michael Svavor. And... I think that the government's policy clearly is no policy. They like to say it's quiet diplomacy. I'd say it's no diplomacy. And so the, the way you push back against China, again, better through multilateral, multilateral places, but also by supporting those people that are being victimized by Chinese aggression. Right, thank you. Um, maybe last question, then I'll give you give you the opportunity for any last thoughts that you, you might have. And this does relate to, you know, the... Uh, I guess not only emerging threats, but I think the changing nature of the threats that we face. And uh, so we have climate change and we live in a country which is blessed with, uh, with wonderful uh, lands and territories and, uh, and seas. And as we see 
uh, the the effects of uh, of climate change, uh, both in the world in terms of the types of natural disasters, and we see those same uh, same effects here in Canada. We see the the effects in the north. Uh, obviously, when it comes to uh, where we invest in national defense and the Canadian Armed Forces, there's choices to be made. And I'm just wondering, in terms of how much we spend on these kind of threats. Uh, with the Canadian forces or whether or not uh, from your perspective, there's better ways to deal with uh, the, the effects of climate change uh, and our Canadian national ability to respond to them. Well, obviously um, the Canadian forces can't be our major uh, line of defense against climate change or any other uh, internal challenges we're facing, but that emergency capacity always has to be there. And again, by providing enough increase in the operating budgets, we can maintain that capacity. And certainly I was very proud of the Canadian forces when they stepped into long-term care homes in Quebec, in Ontario, in Manitoba. And I, I, I don't think people remember that people weren't vaccinated at that time. Canadian forces were putting themselves at risk by stepping into those long-term care homes. And I really salute them for the amazing job they did in very difficult uh, situations. Uh, the same is true with fires. You know, we've had very significant commitments to assist with the uh, climate fires in British Columbia and in Ontario, especially in Ontario, evacuating um, civilian populations. And again, that emergency capacity needs to be there for the Canadian forces to step in and be able to do those kinds of things. And, and once again, I salute them for the efficiency of their efforts this summer. All right. Well, uh, thank you. Thank you for that. And uh, so I think we're pretty much uh, at the end of our time. And uh, but before before I uh, say thank you, are, are there any final thoughts you'd like to uh, perhaps just offer to those who are going to be watching this, uh, those who really are quite interested in defense and security kind of issues and to know where, uh, where all of our parties uh, stand on them? Well, I've been a member of the Defense Committee for six years now, and we have had a tradition uh, up until this year of working very well across party lines to tackle the real problems uh, that we face in terms of Canadian national defense. And I was disappointed this year that things got so derailed over the accountability question for sexual misconduct. And it, it actually became very clear that unless the opposition parties were prepared to give up on having a report on accountability on sexual misconduct, which we weren't prepared to do, that nothing else would get done in this parliament. And so we're left with no report on sexual misconduct. We're left without the, the report on mental health services that we're right at the finish line for, right? We're left without a lot of other things that we could be doing right now. Uh, we have a, a, a conservative motion to look at cybersecurity a, as a committee. And very, very important work of the committee that all got derailed and that the way we've been working together for the past six years is what we have to get back to in the next parliament. And I hope I'm there to do that. Well, and uh, with that, I, I think that it's a message that when we kind of look at the issues of national security and defense, we would hope that there would be, you know, broad uh, uh, partisan support for uh, for uh, for working across the uh, across the aisles with uh, with all of our elected officials because these are issues that I think uh, affect all Canadians and uh, so with uh, with that idea of cooperation really appreciate your own leadership uh, I do know having uh, sat on the other end of the aisle as an official uh, at committee with you that uh, you've always been very thoughtful and I think that uh, those who be watching your answers today will uh, will actually see the same thing so I'd like to thank you uh, sir for your own public service uh, for your own and strong support to the men and women of the Canadian Forces who, who serve. Um, you know, I think we're, uh, we're fortunate to have you as, uh, as one of our members of Parliament, not only in your jurisdiction, but uh, helping to, uh, to make Canada's defence and security better. Uh, please accept all of our wishes for a very successful uh, election in, uh, in a couple of days. We wish you all the very best and look forward to having the opportunity to, uh, to see you in action uh, soon again. And for all of our uh, men and women who are watching the, uh, the, these podcasts with our uh, party leaders uh, on uh, issues of defense and security, you can find uh, some more information on our CDA Institute website on the election, on the party's positions on defense and security issues, including those of the new Democratic Party. So once again, uh, Mr. Garrison, thank you very much. Well, thank you for your kind words, and uh, I look forward to being back working on these important issues soon. All right.